Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, the Faces of Carlsbad, coming to you on, well, from the studio here at Channel 23 in Carlsbad. And uh, we want to thank TDS for putting us on. They like us. And this program, you're going to meet people that you would love to sit down and talk. We have beautiful women on this program every so often. We have handsome men. And today we have a very handsome man. His name is Doc West. Doc, <laughs> welcome to Channel 23, The Faces of Carlsbad. How you doing, Bob? It's good. Well, what we do on this show, usually, we go back into your grandparents, where they came from. Oh, boy. And your parents, and where you were born and raised. And, and uh, you just fill us in on your background. And then, we, then you're going to tell us uh, what you've been doing through the years and what you do now if you're retired, which you're not retired, you're so busy doing so many things. But just let us know a lot about Doc West. Boy, I don't know where to start, Bob. Well, start I, with your grandparents. I was born right here in Carlsbad at the old St. Francis Hospital in 1941. Which is now the police station. Well, it's, uh, well, it's a police station parking lot now. The old St. Francis Hospital is gone. Well, but uh, my family moved here in 1895 from Westville, Oklahoma. Oh. We were fortunate enough to, uh, on vacation last year to take the motor home, go up to Westville and look around. We have a few relatives still living there and a lot of them buried there. It's right on the Arkansas border. Oh, okay. Called Westville, Oklahoma. The old high school was built by the WPA. It's a lot of history there. Mm -hmm. They came there after the Civil War and moved to Carlsbad. And uh, my great grandmother and great grandfather, he had breathing issues, so they heard New Mexico and Carlsbad was a good place to live. So they bought three teams and three wagons and six children and her dad because oh she had just lost her mother mm -hmm. so old man moore came and he rode one wagon and i don't know how many kids he had in his and then there was a uh, rebecca great grandma and jesse clinton where i got part of my name oh i see yeah and uh, they came here in 1895 and stayed here for a while went back to oklahoma took care of some odds and ends and came back permanently. Then uh, Mr. West died in 1899 and left her with uh, six children. One of them died, I think his name was Grady. Mm -hmm. And they've been in the grocery and the ranch's business here uh, forever. And I think Papa finally sold the, grant the uh, grocery business mid-50s. He still had the ranch on the Hobbs Highway. That's where I was raised. Ran away a wild Indian when I was about 16 years old. Well, would you repeat that again? You ran away? I ran away. I decided I wanted to see some greener pastures. Oh. So I took off, and uh, three of us got picked up in Chama, New Mexico, for hitchhiking. They threw us in jail, and <laughs> I wouldn't tell them who I was. I told them I was Todd, somebody from Monahans, Texas, but Wayne Hughes ratted us all out. And uh, oh, brother. yeah, he, he caved immediately. So uh, they said, we're going to call your parents. And I just grinned because we didn't even have electricity, much less a phone. Yeah. So they called Wayne's parents and lo and behold, mom and dad were there. And they said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to Colorado and go to work on a ranch. And they said, well, call us when you get there. And I said, 10-4. <laughs> So I, I laid there. I worked on that ranch for about eight, nine months and decided to join the Navy and see the world. Spent four years in the Navy, and three of those four years was in the South Pacific on a heavy cruiser called the St. Paul. Well, the St. Paul. Uh, uh, if you drive a Toyota, you may be driving part of the St. Paul now. Is that right? I understand Toyota bought salvage rights to the St. Paul. Were you ever able to see the battleship Iowa in any of your tours? Let's see. No, I went to the battleship Wisconsin in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Mm -hmm. That's the only battleship I've ever had the privilege of going aboard. They had much better living quarters on the battleship than we did on the cruiser. Uh oh. But, well, the uh, reason I brought that up is because of the, there's the advertisements out now to save the Iowa because uh, of its history. So 
you might be getting one one of those through the mail shortly. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I get a lot from the um, American Legion. Mm -hmm. And then we still have an association. Every two years we have a meeting of all the former members of the St. Paul Cruiser and the St. Paul Minneapolis Nuclear Submarine. Oh, I see. And uh, the next one will be in San Antonio, Texas next year. Mm -hmm. And I plan to try to go. There's not many of us still, still around. It, attrition has yeah, taken, yeah, taken their toll. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's sad. But I got really, really lucky. I, you know, you always have a few ups and downs in life, but I met a beautiful gal and when I was in the police academy in Fresno. And yeah, how did you, <laughs> before you get into that story, how did you get uh, interested in the police academy? Bob always said there was two, th when I was a little boy, I, I loved being a cowboy, I loved working on the ranch, I loved my grandfather. He, he taught me a lot. But I always said I wanted to drive race cars and I wanted to be a police officer. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I was in California in a little bitty town and they were looking for police officers and I applied for the job in two different towns and I got one. Went to work there for a while and uh, in the police academy I saw this beautiful little girl. And I told my buddy next to me, I said, John, I, I got to get to know her. She is just too pretty to let go. Mm -hmm. And he kidded me, he said, she wouldn't give you the time of day, doctor. And I said, well, I'm going to try. And it took me a while, but I finally got a date out of her. And she was beautiful. But uh, she thought I was just a wild Indian police officer. And, and uh, probably a lot of truth to that. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'd been dating about a month and a half. And the first real date I took her on was drive-in movies to see MASH. And I was a perfect gentleman, Bob. I didn't take anything to drink and I kept my hands to myself. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> And uh, it wasn't a week after that I told her, I said, I'm going to marry you and you're going to be my wife for the rest of my life. And that was in April of 1970. Mm -hmm. And we were going to get married in 71 and I went on midnight shift. I just left Rita and her girlfriend at the county fair. I had a midnight shift to pull. I hadn't been on duty maybe an hour and a guy to call a man with a gun trying to kill his wife. So I took off and uh, I told my partner, I said, I'll go get him. You just cover me here at the door. So I went in the house and hollered at him. I knew his name. I said, come here, I want to talk to you. He stepped, <laughs> it was dark, dark, dark. You couldn't see anything. But a little bit of light coming from a street light. And, uh, he stepped into just enough light I could see the front of his face and a 22 pistol pointed right at me and I said, I said you don't want to do that, but he did and he hit me twice in the chest. But uh, he stepped back in the dark and I said, I got to get out of here. So I stepped out the door and got up alongside the wall and I'm waiting for my partner to show up and come and find out he was on the radio calling for backup. But the old man got uh, dumb and he walked out the door and when he did, I put a gun to his head and told him under no uncertain terms, I'm going to kill him if you make one bad move. And he looked at me real slow out of the corner of his eye and threw his gun down on the ground. So I holstered my gun, picked his up and stuck my belt and grabbed him by the collar and took him over to the car and cuffed him up. And uh, my partner come running over. I said, lock him up in the cage. I said, I got to go to all the desks and get an ambulance down here. So they called Rita and Rita followed me to the hospital and she stayed there for about three days. And uh, finally they really put me in a regular room and took me out of ICU. Well, did you have any uh, protection there? That, that no, we didn't wear protection in those days. My no, gosh. no, we didn't wear anything. And you got two bullets in the chest? Yeah, yeah. Well, one of them's still there. They took the other one out. Oh, my gosh. I've had one doctor tell me 
old Dr. Pendergrass here in town. He said, your right lung doesn't work as good as your left lung. And I said, well, if you had four bullet holes in it, you wouldn't work very good either. No, not at all. <laughs> but no. he's the only doctor that's ever noticed the difference in the two. But uh, went to a regular room and I told Rita, I said, you know, I'm living with a bunch of guys in a bachelor pad. And I said, they're not going to help me get dressed or take a bath or anything. So why don't we get married here in the hospital? So we did. We called the chaplain, and he said, be glad to marry you. And I called the county clerk, and she came over with a marriage license and issued the marriage license. We got married right there. Well, and uh, I can say that I've known your wife, Rita, for many years. Oh, yeah. As my wife and Rita are very, very close friends. Oh, yeah, all the time. And uh, you couldn't have married a, a oh, nicer lady. I don't deserve her. Oh, uh, you, <laughs> no, you don't deserve her. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I don't deserve mine either. So, so uh, she's, a, she's a sweetheart. I, I signed a bunch of checks and told her, I said, you need to go get us an apartment and some groceries and some furniture. And she did. She got an apartment right across the alley from her mother's house. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, that's okay. I don't care. I loved her mother. She was a sweet, sweet woman. That's where Rita got her sweetness. I guess so. I guess so. Well, how long uh, did, did do you have any feelings that you weren't, weren't going to make it, or did you know you were? Well, I had two boys from a previous marriage, and to be honest, Bob, after I called the ambulance, called for an ambulance, I laid down in the yard there. I was having a hard time breathing, and my arm was hurting like hell. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, maybe I'm hurt worse than I thought I was. And I said, no, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm okay. But uh, I was really fortunate. They took me to one hospital. They said, we can't do anything for you here. We're going to take you to a community hospital, big, big hospital. Mm -hmm. And a young doctor just got back from Vietnam, crawled inside me and pulled all the little pieces out. and. Put, put holes and tubes all over me. It looked like some mad scientist <laughs> <laughs> experiment. <laughs> Robot. Yeah, I had tubes sticking everywhere. I guess I, I lost a lot of blood, but it took him about nine years to get, uh, nine hours to get it all done. <laughs> In ICU for almost, I guess, about a week. And I guess I wasn't a very good patient. They said I cussed everybody that walked in the door. But uh, the pain was, I remember, was really, really bad. But, Boy, that yeah. shows a lot of bravery on your part, though. Well, somebody had to take me in charge. <laughs> I didn't want him shooting somebody else. So, what did they do to this guy? Oh, uh, it was kind of funny. We went to court, and they charged him uh, ADW on a police officer. And I had already testified and pointed him out, and I said, yeah, that's the gun he shot me with. Yeah, that's the shirt I was wearing. And, and uh, the uh, defense attorney asked for a recess, and all of a sudden he let he talked to the assistant DA and said, "We're gonna we'll plead guilty if we can cop to a misdemeanor." Well, I won't tell you what I call that DA, no, but I went to the head DA. I knew him real well. He was one of my professors in college. And I said, you know what so-and-so just did? He cop let that guy cop a plea, simple misdemeanor, and he got six months on the road farm. And uh, he called that attorney in, and he fired him on the spot. And he said, uh, don't even worry about cleaning your desk out. We'll clean it out for you and mail it to you. Don't ever come back in this courthouse. <laughs> so he lost his job over the deal, but I was a little upset about that. I can imagine. I'd just soon go beat the hell out of him, tell yeah, you the truth. That's, that's unbelievable. I did get a judgment against him for a quarter of a million dollars, but he didn't have anything. He had beat a man half to death before, and he had everything in his daughter's name. There wasn't anything in his name. There wasn't anything I could touch. Oh, but uh, and one of my professors in college was was an attorney, and uh, she's the one that got all the paperwork and depositions and filed everything for me. But there was nothing to get. At that time, did you ever have any feelings that uh, maybe you should have stayed in a ranch back in Oklahoma or Texas? No. Uh, I went back to work. I think I was off about three months, four months. Mm -hmm. 
and lo and behold, the first week back on the job, we were tracing the guy down the street that just shot and killed a guy in a bar. And I'll, I'll admit to being a little bit nervous, but uh, we finally cornered him and got him and hauled him in. Mm -hmm. Then I got hurt real bad in the jail. I was off two and a half years on that one, messed up my back. Mm -hmm. So about the time they released me, Rita's mom had passed away and she and my mother were real close. So. We moved back here, and that's when I met you. We bought a house right next door to you, and I went to work at the sheriff's office. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. How long and, were you with the sheriff's department? Oh, gosh, I don't remember. From five years, maybe a little bit more, I don't remember. Before I went into law enforcement in California, I did a lot of insurance fraud investigation for about 11 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, I just I got shot at one time in the phone booth trying to call a corporate office and tell them where I was at and what I'd found. And bullets started ricocheting out off the wall in the phone booth. And I said, you know, I'm going to go get a permit to carry, and I did. And I decided then that I was going to go into law enforcement mm -hmm. and start. And I went to college and got on the department, went through two different police academies and got certified in New Mexico. Yeah. So, so it's been interesting. Two great children. My daughter's a school teacher in, uh, in Virginia, Manassas, Virginia. Uh -huh. My son, uh, Don Jr., works for the CIA. Does real well. Has two children. He works out of Langley. <clears throat> yeah. And um, my daughter's third grade school teacher. She got her master's from George Mason and. Junior, I think, got his master's through uh, University of Phoenix, but he's real lucky. He stayed in the Navy Reserves. He's uh, E-8 now, but they're going to change his rate now to a W-03 or W-04. Which is what? Warrant officer, so he'll have to change uniforms, but he said it'll be a lot better retirement check. And he's only got two more years, and he can retire from the Navy Reserve if he wants. Mm -hmm. Well, I happen to remember your uh, daughter and your son, especially your son, primarily because he was around a little longer. And, yeah. Uh, he is quite a young man. He takes right after his uh, father. <laughs> no, he, well, he really is a very sharp individual. He, he is, he is, and he was a great boy. I, I've only had to get after him a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember when he came to me one day and he said, Dad, all my friends get an allowance. He said, I think I need to get an allowance too. And I said, son, what you need to do is get a job. So I took him down to Kern Argus and got him a job delivering papers. <laughs> and in case he started seeing all that money that he was making, and she said, well, Dad, I need a job too. So I doctored her birth certificate and got her a newspaper route too. Oh, did you really, huh? But they kind of bit myself on the foot that time because Sunday papers were so heavy she couldn't carry them. So on Sunday, I had to help her deliver the papers and you had early to Sunday early morning. In the morning. Early in the morning. Yes, indeed. But uh, and and when we moved back to California and I got my contractor's license out there, well, they still had paper routes for a little while, and then Junior went to work for uh, oh so a place like Michael's Crafts and Hobby or something like that, kind of like Hobby Lobby. Mm -hmm. Casey had used her doctorate up birth certificate and got a job selling jewelry at the mall. So they've always worked. Yeah. And there's no free ride. No, there's no free ride. And that's with my father, too. You yeah. Know, I, I couldn't sit around. You had to get that, working yeah. somewhere now. Yeah, I know I made them nervous. They could hear my truck pull up in the driveway and they got busy <laughs> doing something. Well, your, but, your mother and father were wonderful people. Hard worker. They hard working. They were. They were so honest nice. people. So yeah. nice to know. Well, this uh, early, when you were put in jail for running away with these other boys, <laughs> did that impress you uh, that you did, never wanted to sit behind another jail? Or well, another jail? no, it just made me mad because when they released me, they wouldn't let us hitchhike out of town or even walk out of town because they know we'd start hitchhiking again. Mm -hmm. And I had to call Wayne's aunt and pay her to come pick us up, which is about, well, maybe 100 miles, and had to buy her gas. And I was the only one that had any money. I think I had $78, and Wayne had about three. Mm -hmm. Bill had 10 cents. Yeah. So 
Uh, so I had to use my savings to pay for the gas to get out of town and, and get to this ranch where I was supposed to go to work. But you, the three of you, uh, just wanted to get away from the families, huh? Did you? Uh, yeah. Uh, didn't you think about your families being upset and hurt? Well, Bob, I sold some of my hogs, most of the, the small ones, mm -hmm. and I left uh, a big uh, breed sow there that would cover my feed bill, and if they wanted to sell her, well, they'd pay the feed bill, or they could just keep her and raise more hogs. I see. And uh, I just decided it was time to be on my own. Well, you were an independent thinker. Well, Mom was a little bit ornery, and I just decided, you know what? I don't have to live with this. I can be on my own, and I've been on my own ever since. But your we. Mother, your mother was different uh, from your father in many ways. Yeah. <laughs> you and I have had more conversations today than I probably have with my dad in my entire life. Is that right? Dad never talked. Uh, our conversation would be go mend that fence, disc that field over there, uh, cut these two befores here, just. Or I'd get up and go to breakfast and I'd get the plan of the day from Mother and she'd tell me what Dad wanted me to do that day. See, in my family it was totally different. My dad ran everything. Oh, uh, well, Dad probably did, but it was behind the curtain someplace. Yeah. My dad was yeah. not behind the curtain. He was out and said, you get your act together or else. Mm. And I got but, more uh, uh, spankings as I was growing up than I deserved, I felt. But he was well, I felt like I was getting... I felt like I got the short end of the deal, and I decided I'm not going to get the short end of the deal anymore. Yeah. I'm going to high echo out of here, so that's exactly what I did. So, but everything settled down now, fine. Yeah, and uh, your hobbies right now are, well, wait a minute, before we get to the hobbies, uh, what about our Navy career together in the Navy Reserve? You got me involved in the Navy because you knew I loved ships. It was a good unit. It was sad that it uh, broke up and went away. We had a nice group of guys up there. We had a lot of fun. Yeah. And I don't know if there's any of them still living around here. I'll tell them right now. That big barbecue at, uh, what is his name? Uh, Henderson or something like that. Yeah. There were 54 sailors and their wives and kids. And we had barbecued. Uh, what they thought was beef from our ranch, but it wasn't. It was venison. I never told anybody <laughs> except you now that it was venison. It wasn't beef. They never knew the difference. If you cook it right, you'll never know the difference. Yeah. But that Navy unit was a good unit. I enjoyed it. It really was. And uh, every summer we would go on that, what, three, uh, two week uh, cruise? Yeah. And learn more about the Navy? Yeah, I would always go to uh, Lemoore Naval Air Station, which is about 50 miles from where Rita's family and where she was raised. So mm -hmm. we'd just all go together, and I'd leave her with her family, and I'd go to the base and check in. And I'd go home every other week, I maybe. I can't remember if uh, the two of us ever went on the same ship one summer, but uh, probably not. I can't remember if we did. I know I went out in Norfolk, Virginia on the Steinecker, the destroyer Steinecker. Well, the Norfolk, Virginia was the east coast. Yeah, and then on the west coast it was, uh, where, where was our ships kept in the west coast? Down there, San Diego. Well, yeah, there was San Diego and Long Beach. Long Beach, right. Yeah, and that's where we sailed out of when we went overseas was Long Beach. Yeah. April of 1959. Mm -hmm. Went over and, and loaded up with ammunition and took off and went to Pearl Harbor. Did a lot of test firing at drones and sleeves and flo some flotation units. I don't know what they call them with the big guns. Yeah. Did you ever run into a storm out at sea? Oh, geez. If you're in the South Pacific, you're gonna get typhoons. Terrible. Yeah. We ate out of paper cups. You'd put beans here, potatoes here, and milk here in a cup, and that's the we'd be, or eggs and bacon. You couldn't eat out of a tray. Uh, you'd lash yourself down to your bunk so you wouldn't get bounced out. Well, you were proud of me because you said, uh, it's funny, you don't get uh, you don't get a sick stomach when you have no. to bed. Well, I, mean, I said, no, because I told you about mm -hmm. that trip out of Norfolk, of yeah. off the coast of North Carolina, and we ran into a horrible storm. Oh, they have horrible storms and, and, there. Uh, the next morning, after it calmed down a little bit, uh, I came down for breakfast, and these young, young sailors looked up and they said, "Hey, Pop, how's come? You look so good this morning. Did, didn't you get sick last night?" I said, "No." 
No, why? Why would I get sick? Well, the storm we were in, I said, doesn't bother me. Never did. I love ships. <laughs> well, I'd never seen the ocean until I went to San Diego to boot camp. And here's an old desert rat. Never got seasick one time. Yeah. And I don't know how many typhoons we went through, Bob. It was terrible. We'd see those little destroyers and there'd be nothing but stacks sticking up. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd just fly through like little submarines. Well, uh... What do you do now in your spare time to relax? Oh, I took the, what was a garage, it was really a whiskey still when old man Frederick built that house in 1900. Mm -hmm. He built this building behind the house, that's solid concrete building, and he put a whiskey still in there. He was a bootlegger. Oh. And my grandfather was one of his customers, probably both of them, because both of them liked their whiskey. Maybe that's why I still like a little bit now and then. So I took that room and completely remodeled it, poured a new flat floor, and I've converted it into my art studio. I studied art in Dallas and quit painting, but now I've started painting again. I'm learning to cut stained glass and uh, do a lot of photography work. So I've renamed my studio Old Whiskey Steel Gallery, established 1900. Oh, is that it? Oh, oh that's, oh, that's it. funny. And uh, and I'm real comfortable. That's my real man cave, and that's where I'll spend most of my time. Well, it's a beautiful room. I I'm uh, amazed when I saw it for the first time here a couple of weeks back. And uh, well, that's where goodness. that's where Mom would always have her yard sales out of that old garage building. Yeah. Now she wouldn't recognize it today. No, she would not. No, no, no. And you keep pretty busy. You don't. Uh, you don't rest much. No, I got to keep going, Bob. Yeah. No, no. You just. I can't sit still. I'm a workaholic. That's that's my. Probably my. Anchor that I'm going to be dragging the rest of my life is. Well, recently working, too, working, working. Uh, your wife had to return to California because of death in the family. Her, one of her sisters. Husband's passed away with cancer, and, uh, and I substitute teach. So yeah, I was going to say that you did a good job. I understand. <laughs> I, I took care of her five-year-old for a week, and and I've taken other classes too. Mm -hmm. They're a handful, but you got to love them. Oh, yeah. I was, Just get out of hand, put them in the corner. They'll be all right the next day. I was a teacher for thirty-eight years, yeah. as you know, Doc. And yeah. You never forget the no. wonderful years. I, it's, I, I miss teaching. It's a, it's it's a, a challenge. Profession. I can understand. And, I, and I'm enjoying it. I wouldn't want to do it five days a week, but I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah. That's good. So in our last few minutes, is there anything you want to say to the public that uh, let them know what's going on in this world? I don't know what it would be. Just um, I like to quote a scripture probably say it wrong, but it says, let your words be a light unto your feet. So if I something that offends you, just look at me as a biblical old scholar. A and, biblical old scholar. And uh, I'm not, I don't profess to be a good Christian or anything like that. I just try to treat everybody like I want to be treated. But don't step on me, because then you'll find the Irish in me. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, talking about the Irish now, uh, on both sides, were they Irish uh, descents? Yeah, there may have been some German on my grandmother's side, but both my grandfathers, all Irish. Mm -hmm. uh, redhead, Irishman, all my all of my children have red hair. I guess it just goes in the family. Yeah, well, my grandmother on my mother's side was mm -hmm. from Ireland also. And my grandfather, if you walked in the house or got into the truck with him, he'd say, you want to snort? Oh and <laughs> there was a bottle of whiskey coming out from under the seat of the truck, or we'd go to the kitchen cabinet and get a bottle of whiskey and take a snort. It may taste terrible, but you had to man up and do it. Well, I prefer, uh, <laughs> I prefer orange juice or any kind of fruit juice. I, I'm not involved in that because my dad was. I'm sorry to say but I wasn't. And, uh, I drink very little now. Yeah. Rito fixed me a cocktail in the evening sometime, maybe once a week, and that's it. Well, you know, I've been working with Guy Lutman for quite a few years now, and uh, I'm, into, <laughs> I'm into British tea. 
British yeah, tea. Yeah, Earl Grey tea from uh, England. I really enjoy it. Well, uh, you'll just have to tell me about it because I'm probably not going to drink much of that, Bob. Well, Doc, I want to thank you for being our guest today. My gosh, this was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it, Bob. And uh, you'll be seeing it. more of me. Of and, course. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Channel 23, goodbye and good luck. <laughs>